Welcome to Inside Medical Malpractice. My name is Chris Rokosh. I'm a registered nurse, legal consultant and educator, and the president of Connect Medical Legal Experts. Each month, we'll be looking at the malpractice issues from different perspectives, featuring honest, candid, insightful interviews by people and professionals with a wealth of information to share. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now let's dive into this fascinating subject. My guest today is Virginia May, a lawyer, a QC, an incredible wealth of knowledge and experience to share with us. She's entering her fourth decade of trailblazing in law as one of the very first female law partners in the province of Alberta and the first female partner in a major law firm in the 1980s at Burnett, Duckworth and Palmer. There's so much I could say about her, but you can hear more about her bio on the podcast that we just recorded about her gems and tips and advice for doctors, nurses, lawyers, and the general public. Some of the cases that she worked on and the stories that she had to tell, the highs and the lows of working as a woman in medical malpractice. But I will tell you she's been recognized by the Law Society and many other people as a leading litigator. And she's been a mentor and a guide for many lawyers, and I know many people in her life. She's held in very high esteem as a role model and an inspiration. We've talked a lot about Ginny in her role as a lawyer. And now we're going to talk a little bit about her as Ginny as a person and get a little bit more inside of her mind about why and what and how she does what she does every day. So welcome back, Jenny. Thank you. Pleasure. It is a pleasure. It is such a pleasure. It's been such a pleasure talking to you today. So first question, I've got seven of them, but let's start here. Why did you choose law as a profession? And then once you got into law, how did you get into medical malpractice? Well, the first question is, uh, I wanted to be a lawyer uh, when I lived in England. Um, I would have wanted to go to law school, but uh, and not to law school, because law school made you a solicitor. And I had a Dickensian view of uh, lawyers, old crumbling men over desks if you became a solicitor. Not true necessarily, but it was then in England. And to be a barrister, I couldn't afford that. And I didn't have the contact. You had to, for, I think it was four or five years, you um, you worked at the feet of a, a barrister. You weren't paid. And you had to have the uh, connections, you know, the personal connections. You had to have the ability to survive without an income. So being a lawyer for me in England wasn't possible. So could I just ask you a quick question there? Could you define solicitor and barrister for us? Yes. Uh, in, well, in Canada, you graduate as both. There's no differentiation, which was wonderful. You, you tend to specialize as you start articling and working. A solicitor is the person who creates the agreements that a litigator sues on, right? Um, a solicitor uh, is a commercial person. Securities lawyer is a solicitor. Uh, 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 an, an oil and gas lawyer is a solicitor. Well, can be a litigator, but the people who write the contracts, write the agreements, Got put it. together the <laughs> partnerships are solicitors, do the drafting of the will. The litigators are the people who take everything when it's gone wrong, whether the will is being sued on, whether the partnership has fallen apart, uh, whether the security that you bought, you were cheated. Those all bring in litigation and a barrister, as they're called in England. And Mm. in fact, my firm in Canada, we called ourselves barristers because we only did work that would take you to the courthouse. Oh, I see. Now, we didn't do um, criminal work. That's all litigation. Uh, and all barristers work, but it's a specialty that I I did for a few years and didn't enjoy. And we didn't do it in my firm and don't anymore, I think. So barristers go to court, litigants go to court, advocates, if you like. We're advocates for people. Yes. We're fighting for people. Solicitors uh, do bring up to me the picture of the old um, wills and estates lawyers of the Dickensian books you know, uh, fighting these cases uh, and working for their clients for years, drafting agreements, drafting contracts. I went once to uh, give advice to Shell, I think it was, on 
on interpretation of contracts because they live on contracts for the oil and gas, for insurance, insurance companies, uh, lawyers, they'd all be solicitors. Uh, but what they're not always looking for is what might cause me to show up as a litigant, as a barrister, to be suing on their agreement that is capable of being interpreted in more than one way mm, than they it. want it to be. So how did you get into medical malpractice law? Well, when I came to Canada, I couldn't do law in England. So I, I, went, I was in media and public relations and television uh, as my first career for really? a number of years I until I came that. to England and uh, to Canada. And then, <clears throat> as luck would have it, the law school opened in Canada. And I went up to see at an open house what was involved. And the, the dean was an elderly Scots, well, young Scotsman, actually, who said to me, apply, apply. And I did. And uh, I got in. Oh, good And for I you. am so pleased because I was able at an older age with two kids to live out my dream. And then for the next 40 years, unfortunately, I've been doing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. That's a lot of experience. Now, practice uh, came. I, I would get, um, my ex-husband uh, was a doctor and um, that had nothing to do with it, except I met a lot of doctors socially and uh, found some of them uh, quite annoying and quite, um, <laughs> quite. Uh, I remember one saying to me, you're an ambulance chaser. Oh. Well, I said, don't come to me when you're in an accident and need help. Oh. You know, uh, right. uh, 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 I mean, uh, yeah, there, there was, a, there, there was and, and I think it's dying. But in, in that generation of doctors who would now be late 80s and dead, essentially, uh, you know, um, the idea that they were beyond reproach. Yes. And, and I, I have survived thanks to magnificent doctors who've helped me health-wise. Sure. But uh, there are there is room for improvement. And when things go wrong, uh, people are entitled to uh, be able to deal with that through litigation, sure. through litigators, through lawyers. Sure. Well, thank you for both sides of that perspective. Because certainly, you know, within this podcast... I, I have and I think most of us, all of us have great respect for medicine and law because when you need it, you need it and you trust. You do. You do and you trust that it's going to be there. So you're now <clears throat> retired-ish and we were just talking a minute ago, you're living part of the year just outside of a Kelowna. You spent some time in Europe. You were spending time in Hawaii and you've got a house in Calgary. I've seen and six grandchildren. I was just going to say that seven. we I've, just had another one. I've, yeah. seen, I've seen pictures of you on social media, and it often just looks like there's a dozen kids and three or five dozen grandkids. So I know you're yeah. busy, um, but talk to me about how retirement's going, and if there's anything you're missing about practicing law. Oh yes, it's it's terrible if you're a litigator because. One of my skills was being a litigator in life. It, it, I think it's because I grew up with my mum alone and her biggest skill was language and words. I read the other day, I was going through some old souvenirs because there's nothing else to do, and uh, found uh, a letter my friend had written uh, on my mother saying, you know, she had such a turn of phrase and she could make words say something that was totally original, you mm. know, and uh, I'd forgotten that, actually. Sure. But uh, I, I think I got it from her. And if you enjoy being a litigator, examining people, cross-examining, there's no replacement for it when you retire. You right. can't go to a coffee morning or the book club and use your skill, you know. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's a completely wasted skill. You wouldn't be very uh, popular at your coffee party, would you? No, you wouldn't be invited <laughs> often, right? They no. might say. <laughs> but it, it's a, it is, um, I, 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 was, I was playing in, in Hawaii. I was in a, um, oh, uh, shuffleboard tournament. Mm. And uh, they teamed us up. And I had this lawyer from Ontario who does now practice and litigation. And they put us together. And uh, we were both moaning, you know, if you're not doing the work, uh, there's, there's, you can't use it anywhere. Mm, it, yeah. Being a good cross-examiner and litigator 
America is bounded within uh, the law cases yes, that you deal is. with. Mm. And not just when you're in court, but everything to do with the development of a case and it's moving forward. Mm. And and there's no, I miss that terribly because it was a good skill for me. Um, and I enjoyed it. And now I'm, I'm trying to teach it to, uh, well, I do these seminars as, an, as a strategic advisor, you know, to... Uh, but I often start at a very level that people think is too boring to listen to. But it nothing is, you have to start, you know, chronology, detailed sure. time frame, all your facts together, you sure. know. And uh, then you can start to build your cross-examination or whatever it is you're going to be doing. Sure. I sometimes... Think, I love it. I yeah, love it. Good. I did, anyway. That comes across very nicely. And... Um, I mean, I don't. I think nurses and doctors can, uh, you know, have the same fear about where do you get that feeling again? You know, the feeling that you're really making a. Do- How do you get that after you retire? And you know, certainly it's on my mind all the time. So I keep watching for people who've done it well. You know, who've retired really nicely and still manage to keep the mind and body and health and interest and curiosity alive. But, you know, I just wanted to make a comment also on your going back to the basics with, you know, with young lawyers, you know, I think, as you and I both know, in healthcare and law, and we've learned through medical malpractice law, diligence is key. And I think sometimes highly underrated as a skill. Oh, as totally. A, yes. it's, it's, if, you, <clears throat> if you've got a group of young lawyers and... Um, I, I did lec- a lot of lecturing for the Law Society. Mm. And in fact, when I first retired, I prepared all the materials for the uh, civil litigation. Civil litigation is all that goes on in court that's not criminal. And um, uh, I wrote all the uh, materials for those for the lawyers. And that was great fun. Mm. But I wasn't doing any of it myself. I was just preparing the material that people need and the various seminars that we would have yeah it's very important to be thorough um like if you're preparing for uh to examine a witness on what they call discoveries used to be they're questioning now but asking why are you doing it Mm. you know why are you having this exercise what are you hoping to get from it do you know what you're actually got to prove in your case and these are such basic things to teach young lawyers and that's what i do I, I I sort of um, uh, I I don't I can't and won't uh, in my role as a mentor have anything to do with clients. Yeah. But I I I answer the questions and teach the young lawyers when I when the firm wants me to, sure. uh, and you know move them forward. Hopefully to take a very sometimes what's a very basic way of practice. You, 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 know, you, you have your notebook, you have your, what are the topics? You number them, one to ten. I did that for today. Only I got to two, I think. But, um, <laughs> so did <laughs> the, I. <laughs> the, uh, the amazing um, need to have things in an organized way so that when things are going rough or somebody else is, you, you can hop around. You've got sure. the ability and how do you I hope a, that that might influence these young lawyers as they enter the profession of law, that what you're teaching them as a strategic legal advisor, how do you hope that will send them on their way? Well, it, it always seems to have helped people, yeah. The, the thing is, uh, people get to a certain point where they feel they don't need it anymore. And that, uh, that's actually one, one older lawyer in, in my face. He's, I think he's retired now. I haven't seen him lately. He used to attend, he said, all my lectures for uh, the Legal Education Society. And he was telling the other young ones, you, you go to these and listen to Ginny. You know, you'll, you'll know what, um, what, what's happening. Yeah, but what he, it's all about. He, he finally, um, has retired, I think. But yes, it, it, it's a very basic, dull layout, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I don't, I'm no good on the computer. So when I talk about building notes, I'm talking about an actual uh, three ring binder with lined paper in it, you know. <laughs> and I'm very comfortable with that. Sure. Now, if I'm talking to my granddaughter or grandchildren, because they've got uh, um, spreadsheets and uh, yeah. mailbox hidden somewhere and <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But it doesn't matter how you do it. No. You know, it has to be done. That's right. So what's uh, 
What's what are the upsides of retirement? Talk to us about that. Well, um, uh, as I'm getting old, older now. I mean, I'm quite a bit older now. I'm seventy six, but you um, you get more tired, and you don't mind being lazy about getting out of bed, you know, yeah. and uh, having breakfast in bed, even and ridiculous things like that. Yeah. But your brain, you have. To, I have a wonderful book club, but it's in Calgary, not here. So I have to, um, uh, I, you know, I, we, we have great, uh, the book club is a bunch of ladies. We're all older, nine of us, and we've all been teachers or something like that. So it's a highly uh, argumentative group, mm-hmm. and we've always got way different uh, views, and I love that. And we meet once a month, or we try to, not at the moment, of course. Right. Everything is stopped. Uh, I love being with the grandchildren. Pat and I garden and uh, putter, nice. and re- my husband, and we really enjoy ourselves immensely. Uh, but I, 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 I need the intellectual stimulation. I find it difficult not having that. Sure. And I think you grow a bit stale. Yes. You know, you're, you, you think, well, I couldn't do these things anymore, you know. So I like mentoring and giving the lectures. I'm working, actually, I'm going to be working with the firm on developing their auditing program. So nice. that'll be fun. Congratulations. Yeah. You're a good person for that. Yeah. So I'm going to go a little like Oprah on you for a sec. Like what, as a general <laughs> statement, gets you up in the morning? What keeps you going? Oh, well, I value life. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm very, uh, uh, I mean, I, I was very ill back in 2012 and, uh, you know, did, uh, I call it croaking, but you know, you go, uh, you go out for 10 minutes or whatever and they have to resuscitate you. I remember and I that. Came, I remember yeah, that. I came through all that and, uh, not that I remember it, although some woman asked me what I saw and I said nothing. So she didn't talk to me again. But um, oh, really? It, no light yeah, at no, the end I, of the tunnel. She gave me or? a notebook. She gave me a notebook. I think she was a social worker uh-huh. in the hospital to fill out. Uh-huh. And uh, I did see what I did see. Yeah. Where, uh, in my vacant period, I saw whiteness everywhere, but mm-hmm. it wasn't heaven. It was the hall- hallways of the hospital, and I saw masses of people of every nationality and that's because the resuscitation team was made up of a a complete uh diverse group of people really uh, from the hospital yes so you don't uh, interpret that you don't interpret that as a vision of the afterlife okay you interpret that as what was going on to Mm -hmm. me anyway Mm -hmm. and uh I, I actually know that because I met them because I survived mm-hmm. and uh, was transferred to a hospital for vascular surgery and came back and uh, they all came to see me mm. and they were, as I remember them. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. So basically what you said, I said, what gets you up? And you said you value oh, life. Well, I, I paint and uh, there's always, I'm, I write, I've written and published a book since I retired. When well, I wrote the book, in the 60s. I don't think you've got a copy. I'll send you a copy. I don't. What's it's, the name of your book? Let's give it a called, little plug. Come well, on. It's called um, Matterhorn Mountain Summer Experience. And when I, oh. uh, I'd had a very narrow life, well, not a narrow life, a big, wide, experiential life, but family wise, just my mum and me. And uh, when I was 19, I went, before I attended university, I went to work in Switzerland in uh, Zermatt in a hotel at 8,000 feet at the foot of the Matterhorn climb. And I had just, I, I had just um, a gorgeous time there. And mm. um, it, it was just uh, wonderful. Well, said, where could people get a copy of that book? Oh, I'll send you a copy. Okay. It's, uh, I illustrated it myself and I worked there for uh, four months and I went back again another summer. Yeah, absolutely. I'll send you a copy. Um, I, 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 it was on Amazon, but I think I've run out of copies there. Mm. But uh, it, it was my first experience finding out how other people, apart from just school kids or teachers, responded to me as a person. Mm. You know, you don't know who you are if you don't have a large family and yep. a great group of people exactly. uh, who tell you who you are or you... I only had my mum who told me I was great, but I didn't believe her necessarily, right? Right, right. Oh, and uh, 
so I really worked with people from all over, Italians, uh, Croatians, Austrian, Swiss, French, you know, and, um, and, and the population that inhabited the hotel up at the mountain population. So it was, it was, it was wonderful. Mm. And it was my experience of coming alive as an individual. Mm. Well, congratulations and, uh, on I that wrote, book. I wrote that book in the, I experienced it in the 60s, wrote the book in the 70s when I was pregnant with Emma, my oldest daughter. Then uh, came to Canada, became a lawyer, and everything just sat on the shelf. And then when I retired, I got it out again and uh, got published by... Um, um, uh, an art publisher from the university in Calgary, and uh, yeah, it was a great sense of achievement. Good for and you. And Pat and I went back to the at the village, which is at the foot of the Matterhorn, and uh, which is you know the mountain on Toblerone chocolate, and um, we um, uh, we took the book back to the village, and of uh, course by then it was a historical piece. <laughs> oh, good for you. <laughs> because for it was you. so long, yeah. And we went to the hotel and stayed at the hotel with the current managers. And the book is now, it's in English, of course, and it's part of the English curriculum in the high school and it's <sighs> in the museum and um, in the hotel, yeah. So, Congratulations, uh, you. It was, Congratulations. It, it was such a fun <clears throat> thing to do. I but bet. But it took a long time to do it, you know. And oh, yeah. So I, I'm trying to do something else, more writing now, but I haven't had time, literally. Yeah. With being, and I paint and belong to an art group here. Yes. You know, so there's lots of creative things to do. And Pat's an amazing gardener. Nice, so he, nice. Uh, he, uh, he loves being outside. Well, gardening. If anyone who's listening is interested in getting a copy of Ginny's book, get in touch with me and I'll get in touch with her and we'll find a way to get it to you. We'll find out where it's currently for sale. Yeah, I'll, 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 send, you, I'll send you a photograph of the cover. Sure, and, perfect. And, and the introduction and I'll mail you a copy. I've got your email, your uh, residence address, haven't I? I'm sure you do, um, but we'll, we'll get in touch and I'll make sure that you do. So mm-hmm. on the flip side of that, at this point in your life, like that question was, what what gets you up in the morning? And I love. There's always something to do. There's always yeah. something creative to do. I loved your first answer. You said, "I enjoy life," and I think I've no. You said, "I value life," and I think that was a beautiful, beautiful answer. At well, the, I do. Yeah, yeah, I, and that's I evident. I'm, I'm very lucky to still be around, and yeah. you know, I've had, uh, I, I hit the sixties with all sorts of health issues, which yeah. are annoying, but. Yeah. Um, I'm no probably doubt. healthier now, as long as I don't hit a virus <laughs> yes, than I've ever don't. been, you know. Yeah, and just for anybody who's listening, we're filming this, or I'm sorry, we're recording this in June 2020, and we're still at the tail end of social isolation or slow reopening of the world. So when Ginny refers yeah. to not going to her book club and not getting outside, not seeing her grandchildren, not getting the virus, that's, you know, the infamous virus we're talking about. So yeah, we're uh, avoiding it. Yeah, exactly. So at this point in your life, um, what kind of things wake you up at night or keep you up at night? Oh, the world. Um, mm-hmm. Politically, I am so thankful I lived through what I would call a post-war liberal era uh, because I find the current world in many pockets, not just the U.S., uh, extremely uh, unattractive. Mm -hmm. The moral values unattractive, the the aspirations wrong. And, And I find that thinking, the thing that makes me sad is thinking of my children and grandchildren and I won't be around to see whatever happens to them in that mm-hmm. environment, right. you know? And that does make me sad uh, because I think we were lucky. I feel lucky to have lived through the life I did. You know, I was a baby born in the war. I was born in 43. So I, um, you know, I lived in England uh, till 74 when it was, um, and uh, was, you know, I lived through rationing at uh, the end of the war, but the, the Cold War didn't really impact me at all until I came to Canada, and then I think you sort of realized what well, it did. Actually, I went to, I, I went to, um, 
you know, I did campaign for the first time, street rally outside the American embassy over the Cuba missile stuff. Mm. I do remember that. Right. But, you know, but otherwise, the world, the values of liberalism with a low L uh, and, uh, and loving and helping people and um, enjoying uh, the world, uh, uh, not enjoying power, not enjoying wealth, Mm. not finish thinking that being more important and richer than someone was a great value to reach. That just seems to have gone, uh, mm. come, uh, is leaving, you know, uh, not not in our family, I feel, and I'm sure not in yours either. But, uh, yeah, it, it feels wrong to love your neighbor, and mm. I put it that way, you know, yeah. and that's terrible. Yeah. Do you have any sense that this virus that we're all, you know, this world shutdown has changed any of that or refocus some of the values? Well, I think a lot, yes. I think uh, hopefully it has. I think uh, thinking of my own family, I know uh, the three sets of children families, they've all spent much more time together. Mm -hmm. uh, my son in England and his family, you know, they're, they're always together. His wife's working home. Joe is an actor and he's doing voiceover stuff with his own studio at home. And um, the, uh, you know, the family is all together much more. And my English mm -hmm. and my Canadian family, too, are, uh, the teenage kids are around their parents right. way more, you right. know. And I think that's been of great value, you sure. know. Yeah, and but, just, uh, but not much else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you're just wondering after this is all over what changes will stick, you know, and I'm, I'm wondering if that will be one of them that... You know, well, I hope the fact that everybody's having a family supper, sure, instead of sitting on a bar stool at the corner of the barn, yeah. hiking down a sandwich and running off to do something else. I know. I remember talking to a young lawyer quite a few years ago, and she was having her first child and had already made a decision to only have one child and had done a tremendous amount of research in how to raise the perfect child. And mm -hmm. for all that she read about schools and education and exposure and people and working, not working, what it came down to is the best thing you can give to your kids is a dinner around the family table every day with, yes. with a good relationship, a good conversation, an interest into how they're doing and what they're doing and an opportunity to speak as part of the family. So I've never forgotten that advice. And luckily I just did that. You know, I, I was raised that way and I did that with my own kids, but, um, and we still yeah, do it I now. Know. We still do it now every Sunday, whenever we can. It's called the No Excuses Sunday Night Dinner. And unless you're dead or out of town, you just better show up, you know? <laughs> I think I think that's wonderful. Our yeah. kids are all so scattered now, but they usually sure. all come here to the lake because we're on the lake. Yes. And, um, you know, everybody loves to come for at least two weeks, I would say, every mm. summer since nice. we bought this place, which is 15 years now. Yeah. Everybody comes, yeah. uh, you know, almost everybody together. Yeah. And last year we had all our six grandchildren together. I just had a wonderful photo I took on the dock of them all, you know, and uh, and we've got integrated families. Pat has three kids. I have three kids. And... Um, and the grandchildren belong to the two sets, and everybody's so integrated. You know, it's nice. it's wonderful. We got sure. yeah, we married here too. Lovely. Yeah, it is good. So um, I'm going to ask you one more question, and it's a big question. Um, but knowing what you know now about the life and the work and everything that you've done, what advice would you have offered your younger self? I um, I think I followed the advice I gave myself. Which uh, was? Which was the advice my mother always gave me was that, um, you know, everything in, will depend upon what you put into it, how much you work and what you give to it. Mm -hmm. And you have to want to do what you're doing. Don't do anything you don't want to do because she didn't. She'd walk out of a job uh, on a spin of a tail even if it meant no money, if it didn't feel morally right. Mm. I remember she was a private governess in one of these families. I lived in these great mansions uh, for like two years, and then we'd be in a bed sitter in the basement of a damp house, you know, in London. So it, uh, but she would do what was required for to get living money, and then we'd move on. And I remember we left one house, 
beautiful big house and I I was 10, 11, no idea why. She had a huge row with the boss. Too, and I never knew what it was at the time, but the boss was not allowed to have his children, women children in the house. And I presume now it was because of some sexual something or other that might have happened, right? Yes, yes. Because I remember he used to like children to sit on his lap, little girls. Oh, boy. And my mum would say, get down, yep. she'd say, you know, to his daughter and to me. Yep. And uh, she had a huge row with him and we left. There are nine suitcases mm. and went to Brighton. And uh, her value system was, you know, do what you want to do and stay within your value system. Mm. Never deviate. Yeah. If you start to deviate in a value system, like some young people you know, and they say, oh, this is fantastic. We know these guys are in drugs, and they always pay us with cash. Mm. You know, well, that's the start of the thin end. I mean, yes, you're making money. But why, why not? Why do that? You know, you know everything's going to go wrong for them at some stage, and you can get caught in it. Mm. You know. Well, anyway, that- maybe that's too pure sounding, but uh, and I've lived with no money, so I'm not suggesting. I mean, I know what it is to live uh, with, uh, you know, three pounds to keep till the next Friday when the dole comes around. You know, right. uh, with my, but not for me, but with my mum as a kid. Sure, and. Um, you have to keep your moral standards straight. Sure. No, I think I don't think that's too pure at all. I think the best advice in life is simple and pure and straightforward. And I'd love just to recap. You said you're going to get out of life what you put into it. Um, stick to your strict moral standards and do what you love. I mean, there's no better advice than that. That's fantastic. So I just want to say thank you, Ginny. We could still talk for days. I know it, it's... But we'll come back and do this another time. If you haven't, okay. if you haven't heard the other pi- podcast by Lawyer Virginia May, please listen to it. She shares so much knowledge and information about her life, herself, and um, advice for patients, doctors, lawyers, nurses about her experience in medical malpractice. So don't miss it. But it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for being here, and bye bye. Goodbye, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's lovely to come out of the uh, to come out into the big world again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you. Bye.